The ongoing harvest of traditional foods maintains and reestablishes connection between Alaska Native peoples, the land, water, and plant and animal kin. By participating in these practices, the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being of individuals and communities are higher. This is because these acts of being on the land ask for the crucial participation and validation of indigenous knowledge, the consumption of traditional foods, and the ongoing cultivation of our interspecies relationships. These are all key aspects of food sovereignty. From what I've seen in the past, you know, couple of decades, we've relied really heavy on our salmon and moose. And we need to go back to doing things like trapping for beaver and going after whitefish and learning how to harvest the edible plants from the land. And, you know, where I'm from, we do, we have these spots that we go to in the spring and fall where we harvest waterfowl. And, you know, one of the things my dad was talking about, which I haven't really like been able to dig up too much research on, is that we actually used to burn around the lakes and then that would create new growth for the willows, but it also fertilizes the lake and all those things. So then you build up that ecosystem for the fish and insects and beaver and muskrats. So you create this whole little area, not create, but you know, enhance and man help manage this little area to provide the foods that you need to survive. And so there are a lot of indigenous foods that I'm learning about that I didn't know about. We also, you know, ran rabbit lines when I was younger. And with the cycle, the way cycles go, that's something you really have to learn about is cycles and season. It's when I think about what sustains our communities and our families, it's salmon, it's caribou, it's moose, and it's berries. You know, and Alaska's berries are Alaska's fruits, really, right? So we have so, such a diversity of berries that you got to harvest them all. Um, and so that's in t today, those I would say are the most commonly sought after and harvested um, in my experience. Though traditionally, you know, seeking out many of the migratory birds as you get up above you know, the frost line and you're more into the tundra area. Um, you see more of like the, the seeking out of the eggs and the hunting of the um, different species of migratory birds that come through in the seasons. Um, but, you know, salmon, you know, that the, it's, that, it's the abundance of this state um, that, you know, even in you know, the global markets we're known for, and it's a huge part of the traditional diet. Um, unfortunately, you know, our subsistence rights and subsistence practices are the last to be prioritized in the list of, you know, who deserves to have salmon. You know, first it's our commercial fleets, and then it's our obligation to the North Pacific Salmon Treaty with Canada, and then comes the subsistence rights. And so we see the closure of these fisheries, the subsistence fisheries, too frequently. And it leaves us in a really challenging position. Our community is in a really challenging position. Um, in where I'm from, um, I would say that beaver was a, a strong part of our traditional diet. Um, Harvesting beaver, whitefish um, was another big run that came, you know, comes every fall. That was really important to the sustained diet. Um, a couple of the, you know, the bear, Indian potato, bear root, um, was an important fall harvest activity. Um, harvesting and sun drying berries um, to ensure that they were available through the winter was really important. Um, but really, like a lot of the different Plants in you know, Alaska are an important element of the, the comprehensive whole picture of like what a traditional diet meant. You know, in emergency situations, you know, even spruce, you know, the intercambium layer of the bark, you know, was a 
an emergency food, food fuel source um, for eating. You know, it can be uh, consumed if there's nothing else available at the time. So it's a continued thing. You're constantly gathering. We gather chaga while we're moose hunting and and uh, things that we like, like the wild tea. So it, it's busy. If you only live in a traditional lifestyle, you're never without anything to do. You're constantly working and moving. So going on through the winter, people trap beaver occasionally to make their selves happy with the amount of meat, but we all look forward to spring. That's uh, when we go out geese hunting, it's beaver trapping and geese hunting. And then uh, the favorite, uh, our favorite time of the year to get geese is as soon as the snow, I mean, as soon as the sun gets hot and start getting a little water. We like to hunt them when there's still snow and ice because they're nice and fat when they get back. And that's the best. We look forward to those all winter and we risk our lives for them every spring. So that's kind of a uh, moose to goose. That's kind of our season of gathering. Recently, when these companies and the state um, pitched in to provide salmon to some of the villages, and, and I was reading up on it and, and some of the leadership was You know, thankful, but at the same time, we didn't cause the problem. And this is uh, a little demeaning to um, be a recipient because it we're not self-reliant. The hard work and honor and respect that goes into harvesting for ourselves, that's the dissatisfying part. So, it, it's a huge thing. You know, you're, your work ethic, your sad, personal satisfaction of um, being self-reliant from getting the fish out of the net to hanging it in the smokehouse or harvesting a moose and all of that um, is really diminished when somebody is trying to help but they don't understand or see that part. So it's, um, it's like, you know, thanks, but uh, we didn't cause the situation and um, we'd rather be self-reliant and build ourselves up that way by providing for ourselves and our families. When indigenous people harvest from the land and waters, they take only what they need. This honors the practices that have been passed down from their ancestors. When only what is needed is taken, the ecosystems that animals and plants and people rely on have a chance to regenerate. This creates an abundance of food for seasons to come, and ultimately, generations to come. I would say one of our strengths and what makes us more resilient as indigenous people is like, when I go to the village, there's people work together and they care about one another. And sometimes here in the city, you don't feel that as strong. It's still there, but it's like, it's not as strong as it is in the village. And so when we think about harvesting foods, how does that bring families together? How does that bring communities together? We need to strengthen our connections to one another and our connections to the land. And I feel like that healing through food and culture, like food, it's like the, it's like the cornerstone of culture, right? Like we're all trying to survive and you know, I like to look back, if you look back at some of our ancestors' regalia, 
and how much work went into creating necklaces or certain beaded jackets or the calfskin design on a parka, right? Those people were at a state where, where they were well enough to have enough food to eat because really that's what you need for survival, right? You need a place to live, shelter, food, and clothing. So if their clothing was so intricate and beautiful, they must have had enough food in their freezer and they had enough materials and time to go and create this beautiful art, right? And that was wellness. That was wealth. What, what, we've, what we're defining as wellness and, health and wealth, that fundamentally needs to change. Like we should not try to fully adapt to the society and we have to fight for our rights to be indigenous and fight for what we define as a healthy economy which I feel like when you have the ability to share food, then you have the ability to practice your culture and that makes you stronger as indigenous people. We are a part of the landscape in our indigenous worldviews and by being participatory and in relationship, the, that is what helps to create the abundance and the diversity. You know, original land stewards, you know, that is an identity that we all share as indigenous people. The people that live on the land need to be part of it, to be well. When you go out and say, uh, travel 30 miles to, uh, to hunt geese, and, and you get lucky and you come back with 20 geese, and you're able to share with elders and family members and cousins, and that brings you up when you're able to share and provide. It, it makes you feel so good. It's, there's no other better feeling than being able to share. You're part of something. You're a provider and it just swells you up. It makes you feel so good. And uh, it kind of makes you who you are. And, it, and it, uh, I believe in karma. And when you share, it gives you good luck and you, you got to believe in something. You got to believe that uh, when you believe in that system of karma, you get good karma, you get good luck, in other words, from sharing. And it just, um, it's hard to explain how it, what it does to people, but it really brings you up. Once you learn that system, we're taught that when we're kids, that uh, you always share and you get good luck. You always treat people and you get good and you get good luck. So that's a big part of our wellness and uh, keeping us straight in our mind and our body and our soul. I think it's uh, the big part of it. Um, our health and our wellness is being connected to the land and being able to eat the food. Not only is the food good for us um, physically, but mentally and spiritually. Well, it, it uh, <clears throat> promotes you know, your identity and when you know who you are, why you are, what you are, um, can elevate one's self-esteem and self-worth, uh, make, make one more resilient to criticism or, um, you know, unpositive atmospheres. Um, I think that's one way that it can really help people. Um, it's like, and then the work ethic that I mentioned before and self-reliance um, can go a long ways to enhance in one's feeling of self-worth. And also, by the physical activity, um, you know, I think too can relieve like depression and maybe some anxiety. Uh, people can find comfort and solace in the practice, like soothing, you know, and 
whatever is keeping people up at night uh, can kind of melt away. I mean, I, I know it does that for me. Come away with a better frame of mind and a uh, little more enthusiasm for life. The ability to harvest from the land and water means less dependence on food sources that come from outside local regions and the state of Alaska. When freezers are full of fish, berries, and wild meats, dependence on food grown and transported from outside is limited. This can lead to overall better physical health for people and economic stability due to localized market systems. When we, when we go into these advocacy rooms, it's kind of this weird, it's kind of this weird arena, right? Because like food sovereignty is having the ability to manage your lands and your resources, to set, to set the hunting and fishing regulations, right? And so we need to have the ability, we like, we need to be living our culture. We need to be practicing our traditions. We won't have anything to advocate for unless we're doing that. So a big part of food sovereignty is actually the knowledge and ability to harvest from the land and to pass that knowledge on to future generations. And so we need those things in place, but we also need our educated people to help because it's like, I was, I was just in this workshop and I asked the people, do you have any traditional food in your home right now? Like, and where did you get that? Was that shared with you? Who taught you how to make that if you made it yourself, right? And how do you share that knowledge and those practices with your children? Are they going to be able to do that? Uh, managing yourself and, and uh, the people, we teach that. Uh, in camp when we're young. Grandma taught us all that stuff. We, we learned that from our elders, from our uncles. Uncles brought us out to teach us how to beaver trap and they taught us how to read beaver houses by their size and their food feed pile in front on how many we could take. So uh, management is uh, started at a young age and stewardship of our land is taught from day one or from when you can learn how to talk and walk. Uh, I'll say one thing that I tell my nephews, uh, when you can wipe your own butt, you can go with me. <laughs> and that's when they start learning. <laughs> that's true. Um, but I, I, for many years, I've been teaching young kids and uh, growing up how to trap beaver. I take them out on the land. I take them out 30 miles sometimes to a, I put up a wall tent and I take them and I let them teach them uh, about ice and safety and how to read ice, uh, how to read the beaver house, how to make sure it's there's going to be some in there next year and in the future, not to over trap. Uh, they, they see wolf trapping and wolverine trapping on the way. Depends on what time of the year it is, so they can see pretty much a lot of different things. Learn about moose hunting. Uh, I take youngins out uh, moose hunting for potlatches. I, I like to teach uh, good stewardship of land. Kinship with the animals that are going to help you survive, um, that respect and honor, do right by the animals. That, you know, you have a duty to take care of them. They're going to take care of you, um, which can lead to the other uh, traditional values like sharing, sharing of the resource, um, and instill in self-reliant work ethic founded in um, harvesting off the land translated into the work ethic of uh, working on a ranch or a farm all the work that have, you have to do to maintain it, or just a couple of the uh, uh, traditional values and
translate it into an operation like that. Since colonization, the success of the United States has been in a large part the success of the harvesting from the land. The um, a perceived unlimited abundance that provided for the rapid expansion um, of population and industry. I think a large part that was overlooked was that abundance, we were drawing from a bank of abundance, uh, a savings of sorts of rich soil and diversity of game and um, a richness of ecosystem that was the result of the management of indigenous peoples across the United States and within Alaska. The region that I'm from, Mintasta Lake, uh, our elders could tell the difference between um, the salmon where they were going to spawn, you know, their, where they would end, finish their life and you know, bring new life back into the earth. Um, and you know, in years where you know, one uh, stream in the headwaters area you know, was lacking the return, they would intentionally move um, the, the fertilized uh, eggs from one stream to another to ensure that you know, there would be a continuation of the population of salmon returning uh, into our streams. So it wasn't, you know, a passive or inactive relationship with the land. It was very intentional and um, focused on the, the relationship of reciprocity, that deep connection, ensuring the, the vibrancy and health of our, of our relatives, of our plant relatives, of our animal relatives. Um, their health meant our health.